Let's just commit this time to the Lord before we start, shall we? Father, we just want to open up your word. You've spoken to me, and I want to just share that this morning. Father, I pray that this is the word that you would have for each one of us this day. I pray, Father, that, and I speak personally, if it is needed that you need to incise deeply into my heart to cut away things, please do. And I pray, Father, this morning that we will be cherished and loved afresh by you because we've gone through this time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know whether you've noticed, perhaps you don't watch television or perhaps you don't listen to the news, but there seems to be a problem with young people. Is that right? <laughs> well, it's good. You know, well, you're with me then. So I don't have to explain it all. It's not new. When I was growing up, it was the bodgies and the widgies. <laughs> that talks about it, doesn't it? That tells your age. And, of course, if you walked around a dark street at night on your own and you ran into a group of them, I'm sure you weren't going to go home looking the same. In Melbourne, they used to have problems in the early 1920s with the knives, knives gangs. And so... It goes on and on and on. And you know, even in biblical times, there was problems with youths. And Renee is going to bring us a reading this morning, and it comes from 1 Samuel 30. And I think Kim's got it uh, up on the screen for us. Thanks, Renee. He led David down and there they were scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until evening of the next day and none of them got away, well, except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David covered, recovered everything, the Amalek, Amalekites? Amalekites. Um, uh, uh, say? Amalekites. Amalekites. Yeah. The Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Yeah. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Bessel Valley. They came out to meet David and the men with him. As David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, they will not sh we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and ordinance for Israel from that day to this. Is that it? That's it. Any, Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Well, how many of you know that story? Oh, we've got a few hands. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, so at least we're exploring something new. Yeah, that's good. And, of course, the Amalekites were... The rascals, the rascals of New Guinea or the Fulani of the um, tribesmen in Kenya and others, they were problems because they were young, they didn't have any work and they were looking for trouble. You could call them the wandering terrorists. We know all about what that happens in countries like Brisbane and Australia. Yeah. So this was the situation David was confronted with. The Amalekites had raided their camp took away plunder, and now they decided that 
that was enough and they went away started to do some perusing and having fun and dancing and David thought, well, this might be a good opportunity. So he went down and sorted them out, as the, as the word said. He got back all that they had stolen, but also they'd been pretty busy because the Philistines weren't left untouched and they'd also raided them. And so there's quite a lot of stuff left. And David, before he set out, had 600 men. But then, as they were about to go and attack the Amalekites, a couple of hundred of them were too exhausted to go. So he needed some people to stay and guard the possessions at the camp. And so he said to them, if you stay and stay at the camp, the other 400 will go. Now, they've come back. They've come back with all this plunder, plus the wives. I don't know why the word specified that there were two wives, but at any rate, that's what the word says. There was two wives plus all the livestock and all the plunder that had been taken from the Philistines and all the stuff that they had taken from Israel. So there was quite a lot of stuff. Now, when they get back to the camp, somebody had a great idea and he suggested to David, now listen here, mate, who's done all the work? Who's done all the hard yards? Now, these guys that were left, the 200, were they the, the wispy, wishy-washy ones of the army? Of course not. They were warriors, the same as the others that had gone down and done the attacking. They were no different. And David, was he more a public service king or leader who sits back behind a desk and orders people? No. I'll tell you why. Because if you have a look at 1 Samuel, what is it, 17, Kim? Do we have that one, please? And every assembled here will know that the Lord rescued his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give it to you. The next verse. And Goliath moved closer to attack. David quickly ran out to meet him. Does that show you that the leader of the Israelites is a wispy, wishy-washy warrior. No. And isn't it significant that what David said, it was the Lord's battle. He said the same to these people who brought up these suggestions that we won't share. He said, the plunder is not David's. It's the Lord's. The Lord enabled us to win this battle. The Lord enabled us to be able to go down and defeat the Amalekites and to bring back what was ours and what wasn't theirs too. And so he said, it's the Lord who's given us the victory. So this plunder is not mine. It's the Lord's. So that means that it belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong to just those who went and did the fighting. It belongs to all of us because those who stayed behind were just as important as those who went back. There's not much difference in roles. The difference being in what sort of role that they had. But each one is of equal importance. Does that say anything to you? Hmm. I think it does, doesn't it? When we look back at analogies, we could say, there's an analogy here of church service, isn't there? I think there is, isn't there? Well, we might look at that, might I? 
At any rate, I'd like to look at another scripture. And Carolyn's going to bring that to me now. And it's from Matthew 20, 1 to 16. Matthew 20. God's kingdom is like an estate manager who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. They agreed on a wage of a dollar a day and went to work. Later, about nine o'clock, the manager saw some other men hanging around the town square unemployed. He told them to go to work in his vineyard and he would pay them a fair wage. They went. He did the same thing at noon and again at three o'clock. At five o'clock, he went back and found still others standing around. He said, why are you standing all around doing nothing? They said, because no one hired us. He told them to go to work <coughs> in his vineyard. When the day's work was over, the owner of the vineyard instructed his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages. Start with the last hired and go on to the first. Those hired at five o'clock came up and they were given a dollar. When those who were hired first saw that, they assumed they would get far more. But by the time each of them only got one dollar. Taking the dollar, they groused angrily to the manager. These last workers put in only one easy hour and you just made them equal to us who slaved all day under a scorching sun. He replied to the one speaking for the rest, Friend, I have been unfair. We agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give it to the one who came last, the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to get stingy because I am generous? Here it is again, the great reversal. Many of the first ending up last and the last first. Thank you. It's interesting that Jesus starts off with saying that the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes on to explain what he means through this parable. I don't know what camp you were in with the first story. Did you have any sympathy for those guys who came and said, look, we've done all the hard work, and these guys have sat on their bum and done nothing, and yet they're going to get the same as us? So is there any sympathy for them? Hmm. Now we move to this story. I wonder if there's an analogy here. I think there is somehow. You see, where are our eyes fixed? Are we fixed on what's going to be good for me? What I'm going to get? This is my time. You know, in church life, there can be opportunities for you to be become very selfish. You can become very aggrieved. You can become very upset. Why? Why? Because somebody else might get more plaudits than you. Somebody else would get the recognition for all that work that you've been doing behind the scenes. <laughs> Does that happen? Of course not. Well, I'll tell you one thing that doesn't happen here, and that's that. We're very blessed that we don't have self-seekers. We don't have people who are looking for the limelight all the time. That's a blessing. So we go back to the story of the vineyard owner. Now, he went back at six. He started out at six in the morning, then he went back at nine, he went back at 12, went back at three, he went back at five. I think he's wanting to make a point here. So he got these workers because they were idle. They were, what they used to do, they have a, an area. It's like years ago in the walls. There was a certain place at the walls if you wanted to get a day's work on the walls you would go there first thing in the morning and then someone would come and pick out the number that they needed 
And if you knew somebody inside, you knew that you would get fed. That's how it worked in those days. And so it was no different here. There was a, an area in the village where people who were looking for work, generally the men, and they would stand there and wait or sit there and wait until some landowner or some business person came and got people to do some day's work for them. And the day's work was generally a denarius. Denarius was worth about a dollar in today's terms, or in those terms, it was about a dollar. And so they were quite happy to have that. Now, if you're asked to do a day's work and you said you were, you were told that you would get a fair return, you will get what your day's work is worth and you agreed to that, is that okay? But what about if somebody's only worked an hour and gets the same money as you? You've been there in the hot Mediterranean sun picking grapes off the vineyard from 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night and you're getting a dollar, a denarius. A guy who came 5 o'clock, he's worked for an hour and he's getting a denarius too. So is there a temptation to be a little bit aggrieved, a little bit sore, a little bit, well, I think I've been put on here. I don't know what camp that you may be in, but you might have some sympathy for those first guys who started at 6 o'clock in the morning. Of course, you might have sympathy, only for the simple reason that we see here an act of generosity and grace. That's why we're upset. Because, you know what? Is anybody, I don't know that there would be anybody here that's envious or jealous of, of anything. I'm not. I'm not jealous of anything. I'm, I'm not envious of anything. Perhaps if I had an outlander, it might be different. But uh, anyway. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, I'm not, I can't say I'm really envious. I'm glad that some people are better off than me. That's 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 good. But you know, sometimes there is a situate there comes a situation in your life when you can be placed in that situation. And that how you respond to that is what Jesus is, is wanting to get through to us. How we respond to generousness and grace and love. And that's what this landowner was doing. He was being generous. As he said, can't I do with what I want with my money? Not a bad question, is it? It's his money. And if he wants to be over generous to somebody, am I saying, hmm, oh, why didn't he pick me? Why couldn't I get picked at five o'clock? But anyway... You see what I'm saying? So then your mind goes and you say, well, I don't know that that's too fair. But it is fair because right at 6 o'clock in the morning, you agreed to have a day's wage for the work that he wanted you to do. And that's the fair part. You see, what Jesus has done and what we find all through his teaching through Scripture is that he turns the world's thinking upside down. What we take as, as normal and what we think is okay, that's not what Jesus came to, to do. He said to them, if you carry a soldier's garment, as they were required to do at that time, and the soldier could say, here, you take this and carry this, and he tells you to go to one mile, go two. Now, that's a bit rough. I didn't want to do it in the first place. And now he's making me do it twice, twice as far. You see what I'm saying? Here Jesus turns all the thinking upside down because Jesus is introducing grace. And grace is not anything that we can earn, is it? We can't earn it or buy it or work for it. 
Grace is free. And that's, that's what Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is light. And the kingdom of heaven is here on earth, he says. So where is the kingdom of heaven expressed? In where? The club? No. Would it be out in the racetrack? I don't know. I know that the kingdom of heaven is expressed amongst his people where they meet. And that's where you see the kingdom of heaven expressed. And Jesus is saying, look, all through scripture, he says it's not one person that's important, but all of you are important together. Because one, as he says in one part of the scripture, one waters, one plants, both are important. But the most important is God who makes the seed grow. And also in 1 Corinthians, he tells us that, uh, Kim, if you had that one, you could throw that one up too. The one who waters and the one who plants and the one who waters together uh, will be this, will have the same purpose and both will be rewarded for all their hard work. Isn't that the answer to the story of of the parable of the workers. We will be rewarded for our hard work. We sang before having crowns on our stars in our crown. Well, that's what the Bible says. We will be rewarded. We will receive crowns for what we do. But how do we get to that stage of that time of getting our crown? What has our life shown in that progress towards that? Has it shown that we've been a little bit churlish and upset? We're a little bit concerned and aggrieved because we haven't received what we thought we should get? And, you know, once we start thinking like that, again, that's the world's way of thinking, isn't it? Because Jesus said that's not the way we should be thinking. We should be thinking in terms of what can I give? And Craig Rochelle in the video that we saw said you can't love God and not serve. If you want to know where to serve God, and you're sitting here right now, God's already telling you. He wants you here. This is where God wants you to serve. And God doesn't want you to sit here and to be a seat warmer. He wants you to serve him. Now, serving him might mean varying things, whatever talent you have or whatever gift you have or whatever choice you have to, to serve him. Because as that Corinthians reading, as Paul said, is no one is more important. No one job is more important than another. An elder is no more important than anybody else who cleans the carpet or opens the door or does the lawn or whatever. We're all equal. There's no, no more importance than that. Michael has a special role. And that's what we've we've got Michael and his example of to do. That's what you get a pastor to do, to lead and guide and direct. But for the rest, there's no one more important than the other. And if there is one thing that we don't do here, and that is look to see who's going to be the most important. Can I work towards the most important role. That doesn't happen here, which is wonderful when you're working together. Jesus also, when he 
talked about the serving and how we should be approaching our service is that it is not by might, it is not by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And that's what we've got to remember. It's not what I do, it's not what you do or anybody else, but it's what the Lord does. And as that reading says in Corinthians, you know, one does this, one does that, and it's all important and we work together, but it's God that makes the seed grow. I hope that that's true in your lives as you seek to be unselfish, as you seek to be other-centred, as you seek to want to serve him humbly and willingly. And I thank you for that, because that's what we see here. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today that you've enabled us to look at an area that perhaps we hadn't looked at before for some time. Thank you, Father, for David and for his guidance that he received from you. He loved God and he showed that in all that he did and so said. Thank you, Father, for Jesus' teaching that we can see, Father, now that here he taught parables because they had that wonderful meaning, that spiritual meaning which we can apply to our lives today. Help us, Father, to overcome the things that would drag us away from that. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. Thank you, Father, for the way in which we can honour you by our service. Father, teach us to love and love one another, but to love you more and more each day. Thank you that it's by your spirit, Father, and not by any of our works or power. And we can see the evidence of that as we go through day by day. We look, Father, to the future. And we know, Father, that you will continue to guide and lead and direct us. We want to just be faithful to that. We want to be faithful to you so that, Father, you can be assured that this is the place that we want to serve you at. We want to honour you here by our love and service. So bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um.